Good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right. West Virginia, welcome. How's the conference going for you? So are you being well nourished, both uh, intellectually as well as in the culinary ring? <laughs> All right. A couple of Sundays ago, I was watching uh, Good Morning America. There was a wonderful story on about teachers and educators, and I sat there fighting back tears, but the tears kept rolling down my face, and I cried. I had a great cry Sunday morning. Little did I know that other WVDE people were watching it as well with the very same reaction, including my boss. My boss has worked diligently in the planning of this uh, teacher celebration today. He has a wonderful surprise for you as we uh, have the afternoon unfold. Uh, this man does not like or appreciate a lot of introduction, so I will just introduce him as a man with a passion for education, a man with a big heart for kids, for students, for principals, Dr. Stephen L. Payne, State Superintendent of Schools. Did I make it brief enough? <laughs> Good afternoon again. Look forward to having a chance to talk to you a little bit, but before that, I have a great opportunity that I always cherish from the depths of my inner being. Before that, I wanted to introduce my colleague, Dale Lee. Where'd he go? He's, there he is. He moved seats on me. Okay. Dale's from uh, West Virginia Education Association. Most of you know that. Uh, we work closely with Dale. Most of the time we agree, right? Most of the time? I didn't ruin your image on that, did I? <laughs> the one thing that I do know, and uh, as well as AFT, but we have the ability to disagree agreeably, and we've done that, but we, we know how to work professionally together to advance student achievement and to take care of the people that take care of our kids. So Dale, thank you for coming, appreciate it. So how you introduce, you're, you're allowed to applaud for Dale. Yes, ma'am. As I introduced our very special guest there, guest, there are a few things I want you to know uh, about him that I know about him. I've known Governor Justice for a good while. I consider him a friend, uh, a very wise man, uh, a man with a vision. And quite frankly, he's one of the main reasons why I chose to come back. He has done so much for us already. He's eliminated that beloved A to F system that I know you all hated to see go. It's supposed to be humor, Susan. That's about as good as it gets. <laughs> Thank you. And the reason is that his vision for West Virginia is better than mediocrity. In other words, how do you attract business to come to West Virginia when you label your schools C, D, and F? It's inappropriate. He was the, the reason why that is gone, and the state board and I followed suit, and, uh, and it's gone. He's eliminated layers of bureaucracy. He is restoring local decision-making authority at that district level, at that school level, and yes, to the classroom level as much as possible. He was the leader, I want you to hear this carefully, of the 5% increase. I was there, folks, every single day. You heard me say this Monday, I'm gonna say it again. There were a lot of people involved in that, but he was the leader. He was the one that stepped up and adjusted the revenue estimates based on his vast experiences. And the legislature was only gonna give enough revenue estimate to allow for a 1% increase. He stepped up one day and said, we're doing the 5%. And then he came into superintendents. We have several right here in our front row. Thanks for coming. And he met with them and he said, after we talked about a lot of different things, he said to them, and I know he said to Dale and others, don't settle for anything less than 5%. I'm being very sincere, folks. I want you to hear me carefully. He believes in you. He believes in compensation. I believe, and I don't know, I'm not on the task force, that he'll have a solution up his sleeve that the legislature will buy into regarding PEIA and a long-term fix. He may address that, I don't know. I will tell you that he has a heart of a lion and a soft touch for children and student athletes. Um, I will tell you that he's a man that took over a 500 million with an M, 
deficit and has turned it into a approximately 30 million surplus at the same time giving a $60 million increase to teachers and other state employees. And that happened in a year. Now, here's my favorite part. I just said to the governor, I said he's got a great assistant in Pam, but he also has a wonderful, wonderful wife. I don't think that I've ever met a nicer human being in my entire life We've had the chance to work with the First Lady on a project called Communities and Schools, and she is so sincere and so authentic and part of his team. They're the proud parents of two children, and he's a recent proud, proud grandfather of JC. So before I actually bring the governor up here, uh, he would like for you to see a short video. So if we could move the video forward now, and then we'll move on. education plan right here that I'm going to submit immediately. We've had spaces in our state where we've had over 600 teacher vacancies, places where there's not even a qualified teacher in our state to teach our children. It's going to be the elimination of a bunch of unnecessary agencies. It's going to be a look at education in a different way that has never been looked at for a long, long, long time. I really admire the governor admitting that, that you know, the folks on the local level are the experts. I want to restore hope and planning and decency and respect and listening back to you. He has been very, very specific to us in the State Board of Education about making sure that we restore local decision making as much as possible. Education is kind of the cornerstone of everything. It's how our state moves forward. It's how our country moves forward. Our teachers like it or not like it, are underpaid. Now, we've got to do something about it. When you have 727 positions last year without a certified teacher in them, it's a direct reflection on the pay and the benefits that we're receiving. And he very clearly knows that they need, needed a pay increase this past legislative session. And I watched him bulldog that, spearhead that initiative. But there was a little kid, sixth grader, his name was Gideon. He looked at me in one of the town hall meetings and said, Governor, why can't you look at education as an investment in me to where I can become a smart person and come back to West Virginia or stay in West Virginia and do great things? The governor called us in on a Monday and asked what we needed. We came up with the 5%. Uh, he came back and said, absolutely 5%. We're not going to waver on that. This is an investment in West Virginia in the biggest and most profound way. The, the key component to this was making an investment in education. Uh, not only should it be our centerpiece, but it should be something that we invest in. The governor says that he wants to make education the centerpiece of economic development. And that's the way to have economic prosperity, is to have the best education system. If we could create an education mecca in West Virginia, Honest to pe people would come and you couldn't beat them away. It would be a revenue producer. I believe the governor will continue with the investment in education and salaries and making them competitive. We'll find the money in, in the budget to be able to do that. We're showing some economic growth in West Virginia and we may continue that investment in education. You know, the governor has said many times he's a teacher. A lot of people know that he coaches, but he's a teacher. And he loves teachers, and he loves teachers in West Virginia. I have heard a lot of students who are graduating that say, I feel like I can stay in West Virginia now. We are making an investment in education, and I can stay here, stay home. I fell in love with the people here. I fell in love with my job, and I've been here ever since, and I'm never leaving. I'm going to be a West Virginia resident for life. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, would you please join with me in bringing to the podium West Virginia's 36th governor, James Justice II. Thanks. 
Okay. Please, y'all sit down, because I'm going to sit here with you. Uh, I think you can hear me with, with my mic I've got on here. But uh, let me tell you this. Whether you buy it or not buy it, that's up to you. But I really truly mean what I said for the very first state of the state when I said that what we should do is make education our centerpiece. The first day of the state when I said, when things were really, really, really tough, I mean red numbers like you can't imagine. Now you can, again, probably say what you choose to say, but I'm a business guy. I'm not a politician. I know how to read a set of books. And when they presented me this set of books, and I say this in an absolute dead level certain way, our state was bankrupt, guys. Absolutely, teetotally bankrupt. Nowhere to turn. Rainy day fund already drained to a level where our bonds were being derated. Nowhere to turn. And at that very time, I went into the state of the state and said, make education our centerpiece. Give our teachers a 2% pay raise. When we had nothing but bankruptcy. Now, I'll tell you just this, and I'll tell you just as sincerely as I can possibly tell you. No matter what you say, what you do, you have a friend beyond belief in the governor's office that believes in education because I believe in it for the right reasons. I believe we've got great teachers. And I love your celebration that you're having right now and the growth that you're making every day. But I appreciate all that you've already done. Now, I will tell you this, that along the trail, when we got into a situation to where Maybe some of you were really disagreeing with me or maybe even casting a stone here or there. It was tough. It was tough from the standpoint of just this. I love you. And it was difficult to understand how somebody that truly loved you and was trying every way in the world to help, you know, along the trail, there were those at least that you know, didn't agree. Now, so today, you know, I could sit here and go through a bunch of things and congratulate different members for what they've done and all that kind of stuff. Or I could say, you know, well, we got rid of A through F or we got get rid of all the testing, unnecessary testing you were doing. We have a tremendous board that we do have. And Dr. Payne is doing an incredible job. And now we have a new president of the board, Dave Perry, who's a great man. And Tom Campbell has done unbelievable work and all that. And I could go through every single detail of everything. But at the end of the rainbow, the bottom line is just this. Here is the very bottom line. The bottom line is are you going to commit to education or not? Is education something that has to be funded or could it be an investment that's an economic driver? And you know the answer for me. You know the answer in the bleakest of times what I did. Now, if you have somebody that has been a Trojan in your court, it's tough. It's tough. No matter how tough the Trojan is, it's tough to have disagreements. Now, I truly understand because I went around on a listening tour and, I, and what I saw was just this. Whether it was service personnel or teachers or administration or whatever it was, I saw a lot of people that were really frustrated, demotivated, 
And why? Because you were not appreciated. You were taken for granted. You had absolutely been pushed down and wondering what was going to be next to push me down further. And I tried. I tried with all in me on the first, the first session, the first day of the state, and I hung on as long as any human being could ever hang on, and then when we passed the budget, I wouldn't sign it. All I could possibly do at that time was either shut the government down or just let it go on the way it was. I couldn't put my name on it because I wanted what you wanted. Along the way, one thing we really did do at that point in time from the governor's standpoint is we stopped a lot of the additional cuts that would have really hurt even more. You see, my belief has always been just this. All the low-hanging waste fruit, for the most part, has gone. That was taken right off the, out of the get-go years ago. Now we're to the point in time we've got to cut to the bone. And when you cut more, more people leave. And every time you turn around, the hole's still with you. So what we had to do is find a way to grow out of this mess. Well, I had some ideas, and I'm going to tell you a couple of them were Cracker Jacks that I truly believe in my heart that I'm not smart enough to have come up with. They had to come from something way more powerful than I could ever dream of being, and that was the good Lord because they were unbelievable ideas. And they worked. And all of a sudden, here we go. Now you can say anything you want, but it is fact. The numbers were unbelievable bad. You, as good as you are in every way, shape, form, or fashion, as good as you are, you could not have even asked for something with the, if the numbers had stayed horrible. No matter how much any of us would have wanted to have helped you, or no matter how much you would have deserved to have been raised up, if the numbers would have been bankruptcy, 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 your next discussion would have been, can we really afford to go to 70-30 on PEIA? because there would have been nowhere to turn. But now, now there is real promise. We did something that was unprecedented, we really did. We made a big move to say, we're gonna put education at the forefront, and it should be, because in my book, the very first thing that anybody looks at to come to West Virginia, the first thing they look at is, how are our schools? How are our teachers? You know, the first thing. The second thing most people look at a, a standard of life is roads. And so all of a sudden, we've got everything in the world going on there. Now, let me just do this. I could go through every little tidbit, but I want you just to remember just two or three things. One is, irregardless what anyone would ever say, you don't have a better friend than, I, than me. There's no possibility. The second thing is, we're going to fix PEIA. We're going to absolutely fix it. Now, there's a commission that's out there that's working right now that's coming up with ideas, and I'm not sure that the ideas will be the answer. But I can promise you, I can promise you from Jim Justice, from Jim Justice, that PEI is going to be fixed. And it's going to be fixed soon to where you can sleep easy over the fact that you're not locked into a $40,000 salary and all of a sudden your health care costs are running out of, out of kilter. And what am I going to do? So, you may really be surprised. You may honestly be stunned at the end of the day that the very people, 
And I don't want to get into politics because I wish to goodness we could all forget about Democrat and forget about Republican and just be West Virginians. So much do I wish we could be that. But you know, while people are running down the streets, you know, whether they be Democrats and they're waving their flags, saying this and that and everything, and maybe you took a different viewpoint and maybe you thought the Republicans were the bad guys and the Democrats were the good guys today, and it could be vice versa another day. But it may very well be that maybe the resolution of a PEIA may come from the Republican side rather than the Democrat side. But irregardless to me, if it just comes from a West Virginia side, that's all it needs to be. So, the other thing I'd like you to do is just this. And while I'm here, I could give you, like I said, I could give you a great speech and I could rah-rah you and I could tell you how great I am in every way in the world and then I could leave. But I want you to ask me, I want you to ask me right now, anything that you have on your mind, I hope somebody will ask this question and will say, well, Ojeda says all we got to do is just raise the, 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 the severance tax on natural gas and we've solved all of our issues in the world. A lot of you, and let's be fair again, because I only live on truth. That's all I do. Fact, truth. A lot of you got behind that momentum and honest to goodness, Ojeda became a rock star. Okay, now just look, just think, think. Think about this for a second. And I'm not here campaigning for anybody. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not that person. Just ask yourself, what did you get done? What did you get done? Did we really change the severance tax on natural gas? Did we ever get it to a vote? You ran, you ran in the rock star movement. But really and truly, what is going to solve your PEIA issues may have nothing whatsoever to do with natural gas. It could. It could too. But what I am saying to you is just this. You are smart people. You are absolutely really smart people. You're educated, super smart people. You can't get just swept up into politics. You can't just get swept up in something that really and truly, at the end of the day, you may get stunned to think that all of a sudden we could just arbitrarily say, well, we're going to just, and, and I'm not a gas expert. I know a whole lot about the coal side. I'm not a gas guru. But we could arbitrarily say, well, we're going to just raise the severance tax on gas to 7% or something like that. It sounds good. All of a sudden today, maybe an Ohio or a Pennsylvania is a fifth or whatever it may be of our tax structure. And I'm, again, I'm not a, a superstar at this. But all of a sudden what we could see is we could have a higher tax rate and maybe less gas moving out of our state and the net net would maybe even be less money. And then all of a sudden we've been running through the streets saying da 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 and voila, all we've done is run in a political campaign. I'm here to fix it. And I'm going to tell you to God above, you mark it down. We're going to fix it, and we're going to fix it soon. I can't tell you exactly, well, I could. I could tell you exactly how I think that it's going to be fixed, but it's going to be fixed. And I don't know that I can disclose that right at this moment. But if I were to tell you, it has nothing to do with natural gas. And you've got to remember one last thing, and that's just this. Whether they be coal producers, they be natural gas producers, or whatever they may be, tourism people, or whatever it may be, all those people are contributing just like you. 
And, and, and we, want them, we want them to be embraced here. Now, the other thing I want you to remember is this. When I stood up at the first day of the state, I said we should tier the severance tax, tax on coal and natural gas. And you know why I did that? Here's why I did that. Coal prices were real low, and gas prices were real low. And the gas producers and the coal producers all would have been behind that effort right at that time. Because what we would have done would we would have said, well, listen, we'll try to help you a little bit if things are bad, but if things go up, we want you to pay more. And every single one of them would have been with us. We could have gotten it done right then. And a lot of the re representatives that you are just loving to death in a lot of ways wouldn't do it. And we got it shot down. And today, now understand what I'm saying. When prices are low and you say to somebody, when prices are bad, I'll help you a little bit. But if they go way up, we want you to pay more. They say, well, gosh, yeah, we'll do that. Because shoot, fire, we'd be tickled to death. Tickled to death if prices went up. Well, we'll pay more if prices go up. But if you'll just help me some now. And I said, that's what we should do. Well, you know what happened? Prices have gone up. Now, I'll pick any of you and just ask you just this question. Let's say you're selling apples, and you're selling apples for 10 cents a dozen. And all of a sudden, I say to you, if apples stay at 10 cents a dozen, we ought to help you a little bit, reduce your tax burden. But if apples go to $2 a dozen, we want you to pay more. You say, oh, yeah, I'll do it in a second. I love that idea. I'll do it in a second. So the gas people and the coal people were all behind it. And we didn't get it done. And now you know what's happened? Gas prices have gone up. Coal prices have gone up. Now when you go to them and you say, we just want you to pay more now, then you get a different response. So... We don't win them all, and we blew a little bit of an opportunity. But the one thing you can count on, you can count on just this. This state's rolling. Our economy is moving. You're about to hear more news come in the very near future that should blow you away. And I'm going to tell you, as it rolls, if you have somebody that's committed to education, you're going to do better. Our classrooms are going to do better. Our students are going to have the opportunity to have jobs here and stay in this great state. You know how good it is. I know how good it is. The world is starting to know how good it is. It's amazing. It is amazing how people on the outside always thought we were dark and dingy and ignorant and everything else under the sun. And now those people are saying, did you know West Virginia is an absolute jewel and we just missed it? Did you know what a jewel West Virginia is? And we just missed it. And you know what? They're coming. Now, we got a long ways to go. And we got a bunch of people who are still hurting. And I'm going to try everything in my soul to continue to try to help every single one of those I can. And I've said it a billion times, I don't want a thing. I don't want anything on the planet for Jim Justice. Nothing. There's nothing you can give me. Not status, not ego, not the next hot business tip, not money. There is nothing you can give me. Nothing that will motivate me. Now, you can buy it or not buy it, but I'm here for one reason and one reason only. It's you. It's you. It's our kids. It's this great state. That's all there is to it. Now, ask me anything you'd like to ask. And you can, you can ask anything except how much I weigh. <laughs> Somebody ask something, please. Now, come on. I know you're not bashful. Okay, I was going to say, we have two microphones here at the front. If you could just come up and say your name so that the whole group can hear you. You don't even have to say your name. Okay, you don't have to say your name. <laughs> Make up an alias if you... My name is 
Robin. I'm from Webster County. Back in January, Ojeda was already saying that the teacher strike was coming. He could see that it was coming clear in January of this year. Before the teachers even started thinking about it, he knew it was coming. He was already trying to make reason, trying to come up with something. The severance tax was just one of his ideas to help bring more money in. Before the strike even was a thought in our mind, what were you doing back in January for us? Okay. See, that's the tough, that's the tough spot. That's the tough thing for me. Because here's exactly what I was doing. And that's why it's tough. I mean, that's, you know, again, if you've been a great loyal servant and people don't get it, it's tough. I knew the strike was coming too. Anybody, anybody would have known that that, that had a real potential. Now just think about this just for a second. Again, you can believe it or not believe it. How in the world would you think the guy that wanted a 2% pay raise when things were really, really, really bad, how would you think that that guy could possibly now not want things when things started to look better. Think about the logic behind all that. I mean, where did it come from? And here's exactly what happened. When I went through the 2% deal, I had many, many, many Democrats and many Republicans that came to me and said, can you get off this, please? Because we do not have the money to do this. Can you please back off of your 2% pay raise. Are you totally committed to that? And I held on and held on and held on and held on. And it was just as many Republicans as it was Democrats. I've told you this story a thousand times. You believe it or not believe it. But we got to alter time. We had to vote. We had enough votes on the Republican side to pull it off. And what happened at that point in time, really and truly, is exactly this. And I could stand, if God was standing right here, and I'm a Christian through and through. And if he were to say to me, Jim, I will send you to hell right now if you're telling anything but the truth. We needed probably 24 or 5 Democrat votes to pass the veterans exemption, your 2% pay raise, an exemption to Social Security, a rebate check for the poorest people and all that. And at that point in time, the Democrats got in a food fight and walked away. Now, that's what happened. I felt like this, and it's your name's Robin, is that correct? Yes. Robin, now it's January, and we're worried about a strike. And here's what I did. Here's exactly what I did. And Dale Lee could attest to this. But he sat in my office, and we were sitting right there. And I said, Dale, I could not get the 2% pay raise for the teachers through. But by God, we've got to get it done now. We have to get it done. The only way that I know you can do it is do one and one and do it for everybody. Everybody. And then Dale turned to me and said, Will you do that and still do one, one, one in addition to that? And that is to the God above. That is where we came up with one, 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 one. And Dale wanted to get to five, and I wanted to get to five tomorrow. We wanted to do it tomorrow. Now, to be perfectly honest, the reason it was done that way from my standpoint was that's all I thought I could get done. That was it. And then you came to the forefront. You did. And then all of a sudden, minds started to move and to change. And when you came to the forefront and showed your voice, minds started to change. 
And then that conversation went from that to exactly what we wanted it to do. It went from instead of one, 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 one to five. And that's what happened. Was that before or after we were referred to as dumb bunnies or told that we were worthy? Because Richard Ojeda told us we were worthy. You told us we were a bunch of dumb bunnies. And I'll give the bike to someone else well, now. Well, listen, listen. And, and Robin, I'd tell you this. Is I didn't come, I didn't come today to debate Ojeda and me, but but here's but but I will say this. I will say, what have I gotten done for you? And what has Ojeda gotten done for you? And the other thing I would say is just this. I think, and I don't know, I don't know because I, I, I my folksy language is not meant to be demeaning at all. But I would say to you just this, I would never on the planet walk up to you and say, you know, you bunch of teachers are just not smart. There's no chance on God's earth I would do that. Now, it would be my way to say, don't be a bunch of dumb bunnies. It would be my way to do that. Now, if that befriends you, then I'm sorry. You know, but it would not be meant in a tone or a way of really truly meaning or believing that you're not smart. It would just be, it would be meant in this tone that really and truly behind all those scenes, if you were trying to help you like crazy and you couldn't get it done any other way, I didn't want you to screw it up. Now, please ask me something else. Governor of Justice, my name is Nathan Smith from Summers County, kind of like folks? neighbors there. Uh, first off, I want to say thank you for being here. I know that it took a lot of guts to be here, and we appreciate that. And we appreciate you listening to us, and we appreciate anything and everything that you do for us. One suggestion that I have, um, currently as teachers, we get 12 sick days and three days without cause. So basically we get three vacation days a year. Um, we're working almost 11 months out of the year now. We don't even get a week's vacation. Something I'd like for you to think about is maybe up in that three days without cause to five days, that way we can at least have a week of vacation so that we can do stuff that normal working individuals get to do. So thank you, sir. Was, was your name Nathan, is that correct? Okay. I think for people that couldn't hear Nathan, I think, you know, Nathan's basically saying, you only really get three days vacation, and, and what he would hope we would consider is to being able to change that to five days to where you'd have the ability to have at least a week of vacation. And look, Nathan, you know, to me, that's easy stuff. I mean, really and truly, I, you know, it, it all boils right down to this. My dad would have always said, don't confuse effort with accomplishment. Well, you achieve, you achieve. You know, to me, I guess that is really something that I would, I really, it's not my decision, it's the board's decision to do that, not mine, I think, and everything. But uh, let me just tell you, I, again, and I, I understand, I guess I understand, I understand, you know, animosities, but, uh, but if, I could, if I could write this second and say, I'm going to sign that, I'd sign it in a second. You know, because to me, that's a nothing ask. It's, it's a reasonable ask that families would like to go somewhere for a week. It's a nothing ask. You know, but... Uh, the net of the whole thing is just one thing, and that is just, just this, and I wish somebody else had asked something else because I'm running out of words, but, but 
Yeah. Governor Justice, thank you for your time. My name is Dustin Lambert. I'm the principal at Marlins Middle School. We're next door neighbors. I live in Minnehaha Springs. And I'm often concerned as a principal, my number one priority is the safety of children. And many of our schools in West Virginia are falling down. And SBA has been generous to us this year. They've given us some funds to uh, fix our high school. But my school in particular is without AC. So windows are open, doors are locked. And I'm very concerned about the safety of children. Do you have a plan to sustain the safety of children in schools that are without AC but still need to be secured? Okay. I, 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 I can't hear where the who and everything, but, but I think what your, your, your question surrounds the condition of our facilities and do we have a plan that will ensure that our facilities will be upgraded or maintained in a better way? Right, correct, yes. Okay. Let me ask you just this, and I'll answer my question for you. But what if I were to say to you, what is my job? What is the number one thing that I've got to do? What would be the very number one thing that I could do to best help you? And you know what that is? The number one thing. It's not make sure that your facilities are good or that you've got your pay raise or fix PEIA or, or the vacation days. It's none of that. You know what my job is? My job is to get this state economically going to where the dollars are available to do all that stuff. If the dollars aren't available, You've got to know that none of that's going to happen. None of that's going to happen. You went through six straight years of cut, 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 cut. That's what you did. There was no other, word, no other place to turn. Now, my job is to get this state rolling. And then my job is to turn around and try to make education, amongst other things, but education push it to the front of the, front of the line. Now, I would say, to answer the question directly, yes, we do have plans. We have real plans to upgrade facilities and maintain facilities. And yes, I truly believe we're going to have the monies to do that. That's what drives every single thing. Now, think about this for a second. You had a guy that's sitting on this stool, and this stool must be pretty tough, but you had a guy that said, with every successful road bid, if Nathan got the job and he bid $10 million, he's got to pay a 5% bidder's fee. We had it done, and it just, poof, went away. I was going to put all that money in a bucket and combat this terrible drug epidemic. That's what everybody knew. All that money was going right in a bucket. When we bid these jobs, once they had all go, $3 billion of road work would have been $150 million that you'd have had in the bucket to build treatment facilities or to hire additional law enforcement or social workers or whatever to combat a drug epidemic. I would tell you just exactly this, sir. As we move forward and you begin to see more and more numbers, every time you see those numbers, dial into those numbers. Those numbers are everything to you. If you see this state with surplus dollars, you can demand more. If you see this state backing up, blame me. If you see this state going above, it'd be nice if somebody would give me a Twinkie. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you for coming today, Governor. Uh, I'm Robin's husband, but I'm going to throw you a lifeline. 
We're going to try to get off the strike for just a minute, and uh, I would like to just tell you a little bit about what I have experienced. I'm a second-generation construction worker who was forced to leave the state right after high school. I stayed in Charlotte for about 20 years where I started out as a carpet puller, and because of my high school education, what I did learn in high school uh, enabled me to climb through the ranks, and I was the head of my department when I, I left. And the reason I left is because I missed West Virginia. I stayed down there for 20 years. I worked, I was active in the community, I was in uh, church groups and youth groups. I've always worked with teenagers my whole life because of what I experienced when I had to leave West Virginia. Uh, when I came back, uh, I found the state was basically the same as it was in 1989 when I left. And uh, that troubled me. I fell into teaching completely by accident, and uh, for the most part, I've loved it. Yeah, we won't get into that. Uh, but I, it's, still, it's still such a struggle for me to get my kids ready. I teach carpentry. It's hard for me to get them ready for a world that they can't comprehend. If you're born and raised in West Virginia, you want to stay in West Virginia. And my kids can't stay here. People are coming to West Virginia. What are they going to do when they get here? Because every year when my kids graduate, they go to Virginia. They go to Pennsylvania. They go to North Carolina. They go to Ohio. West Virginia has built the East Coast with our major export, and that's us. If you go anywhere in the country, if you go anywhere in the world, and you start singing Country Roads, everybody knows that song because there's somebody from West Virginia all over the world, anywhere you go, and we're excelling in the positions that we take there. Why can we not excel here? It's because we have a ridiculous tax structure. We have so much red tape that it is just impossible to start and own a business here as a family business. And if you're a major corporation, you can come in and cut through all the red tape with your lawyers and your money. But for the people of West Virginia, we have got to do something so that our students that we're preparing for the world can stay here with their, um, with their talent, with their ability, and with all that they have and succeed right here in West Virginia. And I'm glad people are coming. I, I really am. I met a young man that works on the pipeline from Oklahoma. Uh, you'd think Oklahoma, wow, what a beautiful state. He was overwhelmed with the natural beauty and he just went on and on about how much he loved West Virginia and its people and he's never leaving. Pipeline can leave, I'm staying. And you know, that's great. Uh, what can we do, for God's sake, what can we do so that our people can stay here and actually prosper? Okay. No, you're right. You're exactly right. What if I said to you, that's not going to happen on my watch? It's not happening on my watch. I've been here 20 months, 20 months, 20 months, and think about what has been accomplished, what is going on. Now, I'm telling you, you're exactly right. West Virginia almost made the world. We sacrificed all kinds of wonderful young men and women, you know, in our wars. We've done, we've done everything under the sun. Our coal absolutely fueled our armies. We fueled the world. And you're exactly right about something else. West Virginians, when they went to North Carolina and stood in a line waiting to be interviewed on construction, people walked the line and said, anybody here from West Virginia? And pulled them out of the line, did they not? and said, you're hired. Now, I am telling you, I am telling you just as straightforward as I know how to tell you, I am not a king, and I am not the good Lord by any stretch of the imagination. And it can't be changed just like that. But if you don't believe this state's changing, and it's changing at light speed, then you've got to be living in a cave. That's all there is to it. And I'm not surely referring to you, sir. I'm not referring to anybody here. It is just fact. This state is moving like nobody's business. Things are happening. Jobs are coming. Tourism, tourism. Just think about tourism. We did an ad campaign on tourism and we started down our path. Think about this, sir. If you're not proud of your own pond, you're not much of a frog. Now, most all of you people are from southern West Virginia. 
and nobody loves southern West Virginia like I. The Coalfield Expressway has been on the books for 28 years now. 28 blooming years. You watch what happens on my watch. Just watch what happens right there on my watch. In all honesty, tourism is going to give, I mean, we just announced numbers on tourism to where we had occupancy rates of people coming to our state up 16% June to June. The national average is 1.7. Just think about it. This can't change that quick. It can't. But my goal is your goal wholeheartedly, sir. My goal is to bring our families back together, to not let our kids leave, to not be in a situation. I ran. My, my campaign was on this. Aunt Edith wants to have a picnic this Sunday, and she, she wants her grandkids to be there, and she can't have it because her grandkids are in Atlanta and Charlotte and Denver and all over the world. That was my campaign. I want exactly what you want. And I don't say this facetiously toward the good Lord, but by God, this isn't going to happen on my watch. I'm going to make it better. Because you see, I don't need anything. I don't need the next house office reelected. I don't need anything. I need one thing, goodness for you. I appreciate you. I really do. I'm glad you're back here too. Yes, Governor. Uh, Alan Long, Principal in Wood County, uh, McKinley Elementary. <clears throat> uh, I, you know, every year in our schools. Wait just a second. You, you didn't say you were Rob Cornelius, did you? No, sir. <laughs> I'm just teasing. That's all right. <laughs> but, um, <clears throat> you know, every year as a principal, I start the school out and I give my teachers a you know, very high, low SES population and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, I always have a sense of urgency uh, every year. I want test scores up. I want our kids to have a nice climate culture for our school. And, you know, I, I try to, my teachers help me out tremendously with that. I've got a great staff. Uh, that's why I'm still there. Uh, but, you know, I'm just going to pose this question to you. What can we do to help you and to achieve the goals and to, to do stuff to make things better? I mean, we have a lot of educators in this state, and, you know, we can, you know, we'll guide our students the way that we need them to, to be guided. But we'd also like to help in this situation. I, I always feel like that we're always complaining about stuff. But, I, you know, I don't want to be seen as a complainer. I want to be seen as a person who's going to, to make a difference and to fix things. And this is probably a very difficult question, a tough question to answer, but, you know, I, we know you're out. I, I think you're out there on a limb every day. And I'd just like to know what we can do to help you. So thank you. Well, you're, you're kind in your question. <laughs> Let me tell you this. You know, the biggest thing you could do to help me, that was the question. What can you all do to help me? And the biggest thing you could do is just this, is, you know, I'm a big guy. And I handled a lot of businesses, and there's times you got to be tough. And I can be that. And I can even be the town redneck, too. I can. But I'm also a guy that is, I have a virtue and I have a curse, and it's the same thing. I really care. I really genuinely care. And if you really care, and then all of a sudden, whatever the reason may be, you know, it doesn't work out, that can become a curse too. So the best thing on earth you can do for me to perpetuate me on your behalf and on our state's behalf and everything is believe. Believe that I'm with you because I am regardless of what anybody in the world would say, I'm with you. And I'm going to go to the death to try to help you every way in the world I can. Now you have restraint. You know, you have 
you have governing bodies, other people, and you have monetary constraints and everything else. But I'm telling you, that's the biggest thing you can do for a guy that's tough, and a guy that's done a lot of stuff, but a guy that's still sensitive too. Yes, ma'am. Or get no, but somebody, no, go ahead, please. Okay. Hi, my name is Jenta Chung. I live in Mingo County, but I work in Wayne County. And, um, you know, I'm the daughter of two former educators and who were basketball coaches and all that kind of thing. And, and we were, I know you work closely with educators. But my question for you is first, I want to say is I know that we got a pay raise. And I know that might not have been everybody's. What they wanted out of this whole thing is the pay raise and the PEIA. But we got a pay raise, and we're thankful for that. However, their teachers in this state are still hurting financially. And we go into classrooms every day and look at faces. I'm from the coal fields, where the majority of our kids are, come from homes who are low income. And we tell them that education is their way out of their circumstances. However, the reality is that many of us are still living in poverty. Our families still qualify for government assistance. I mean, in this great state, yeah, we got a raise, and that's wonderful, but our families are still hurting. But we're looking at faces and telling them that this is their way out when we're living that life, that we're still hurting, that our families are still hurting. And you said, and many of our teachers are leaving this state. I have children, a, a child right now, in, going in the third grade. I want the best education that she can possibly get. However, if we don't have competitive wages, our teachers are leaving. I mean, leaving. We have all these vacancies. How can we as teachers be better if we're not pushed to be better? If you have better educators in this state, they're vying for my job. You're going to have better results. If, you have, if we're using anybody to fill positions, we're not pushed at our fullest capacity either. And to me, the only way we can do that is to offer competitive wages. Now, I've heard you say, these are the quotes that I heard you say opening. There is real promise here. We are going to put education on the forefront. You talk about plans that you have for us in the future. What are these plans? To ensure that our educators are not leaving and that our kids are going to get the education that they deserve. It's, it's a... Not only is it a good question, but it's reality, isn't it? It I is mean, reality. I and, mean, we lived it. And here's something else that, you know, that you, you do, and you do it all the time, is you have kids that come to your classes and they don't have pencils or they don't have notebooks or whatever, and you're, or you don't have supplies, whether they be art or whatever, and you go buy them out of your pocketbooks. And I know you do that. Here's the thing that is the reality, again. What if, what if I had walked into the legislature this past year at the, at, in my state of the state and said, we didn't do the 2% before, I want to do 5% right now. What would have been the outcome of that? It would have been really, really tough. Now, what needs to be done is great. We got a 5% pay raise, great. We absolutely need to do more. The beauty of doing more is just what I've tried to tell you without disclosing things that I don't want to disclose right now, but the beauty of doing more is first and foremost the state doing better so you can do more. And then you have to have someone that prioritizes what to do more with. Meaning just this, let's say you had an extra $100 million and your pay raise was 5% or whatever like that. Everybody's cost 60 million last year or whatever. Let's say you had $100 million and you said, I'll tell you what to do because we don't want, we want to be competitive with the other states. We want the other states to send teachers to us. We don't want classrooms without a teacher in them. And, and let's say you had, you had funds available. And let's say we said, well, we're going to raise the teachers. We're going to raise everybody. Another 3%, we're going to raise the teachers 5 or 8% more. And then the next year, you still got money. And maybe we can even do more. 
That's the answer, because, but the answer all becomes priorities. If, if you, you do the same thing in your household, if you've got an extra $300, you decide what is important. What is the most important? I've told you what the most important is to me. And at the end of the day, whether you buy it or not buy it, it doesn't matter to me on that. Now, I'm sensitive, and that bothers me. But really and truly, I know what I think is important. Our kids, you, are the absolute cornerstone to our economy, and that's the way I believe it. Yes, ma'am. I'm a proud West Virginian. Uh, my name is Kenetha Parker Howes, and I, I do teach in Webster County. I'm a teaching principal at a small school. But uh, one of the things that uh, in rural areas, uh, it's a complex problem probably all across West Virginia, but uh, drug abuse. And you referred to that earlier about drug abuse. Sure. But one of the things that I see as being uh, a solution, or maybe not a solution, a contributing factor that could improve the situation is uh, more mental health professionals. I'm not talking about school counselors or support services, but I'm really talking about mental health professionals being available and collaborating, making structures so that we can collaborate easily with each other. Now, the nearest town for me is 30 miles away. You know, so in rural areas, there are real pockets of deficit mental health professionals. So I would encourage you to encourage whoever influence uh, services for those uh, situations. Well, I, I couldn't agree more. You know, I, look, y'all, many times, I mean, I, I'm thinking about this, my grandparents came from Cyclone, West Virginia, and Copperston, West Virginia. My grandparents in Copperston had an only child, that was my dad, and he ended up an Air Force captain and my best man at my wedding. You know, every time I ever visited them, they had a coal-fired furnace in the head that, that, that basically heated their home and there was a grate in the middle of the hallway and you had to jump across it if you were barefoot at night because it burned you to step on it. My other grandparents, they had a pot belly stove in the middle of the, of the living room or family room and they never had indoor plumbing. We're a state that has challenges. We're a state that has kids with real issues and we need and you know I mean just think just think one social worker covering seven schools with a thousand different kids in all the schools total what are they accomplishing they can't accomplish anything it is almost impossible an impossible task sure sure we need, again, I keep saying the same thing, and I'd say it to the top of the mountains, to all of the politicians in the world, not just in West Virginia, in the United States especially, in this great country that we have that is unbelievable, the country that we have, through the years, we have regressed and regressed and regressed educationally and we have, and I believe, I believe wholeheartedly that we, and I say it to the world, to the entire world, you best better invest in the most important thing of all, and that's education, mental health, social workers, every aspect of everything, facilities, use our teachers, for crying out loud, you know, how can somebody that's living on an income of $42,000 be, buy, be buying the art supplies for my kids that are coming there? You know, it's just, it's just a matter of priority. I keep saying the same thing. I can't fix this in one day. I couldn't fix our state in one day. But honestly, 
step back and just look at the numbers and, and stay focused to the numbers because as the numbers improve, I promise you with all my soul, you are the priority. Please. My name is Michelle Perkins and I'm from McDowell County. I'm one of those transplants that's been here for 15 years and taught for the last 10. Very good. So, um, and being from McDowell County, you know, we see a lot of needs and we're grateful for the pay raises that we have received. But money to us is not the only thing. Our county doesn't have money. We've lost teachers, we've lost programs. Our high, one high school in the county no longer has a business program or a home ec program. Our, our old high school ha doesn't have an arts program anymore. But some of that is because the taxes are not coming into the counties like they should. As teachers, we're supposed to be role models, and I would think that as a governor, you too would want to be a role model in that respect. And so, you know, where is that money going to come from? And if you could just make it right, you've alluded to being a Christian, you've alluded to money coming into the counties, and so maybe you need to start by making it right in that respect for our counties. Okay, now, I, 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 I'm not positive that I understand the question, but uh, if, if the question, if the question is associated with my personal tax dilemma, you know, I would tell you to just, just, I would tell you the exact same thing I've told you over and over. The coal business got really tough, did it not, for a long time. And company after company after company took an easy way out and they declared bankruptcy. Not citing, you know, the Alphas or the Arches or Patriot or whomever it may be, but there was billions, not millions, but there were billions of dollars where people got stiffed. Like it or not like it, but I didn't do that. 55 companies went bankrupt. It had been the easiest thing in the world for us to have done, picked out the ugly babies and just got rid of them. And the banks or the stockholders or the vendors, just forget them. But we didn't do that. And so the battle through all that was really, really, really tough. I've told you this, and you'll see, you'll see in the very, very, very near future, you'll see all of our tax people that will step forward and say every single obligation period is paid in full. It was tough. It was really tough. There was disputes even. There was even a situation to where the Russians came along and, and bought our company and then walked away from West Virginia and were leaving. And in your very county, in McDowell County, there was $5 million of property taxes owed and I paid every dime of it. Russians, the Russians would have left and never done a thing. I did exactly the same thing in, in Wyoming County. And at the end of the day, what I'm saying to you is every single obligation will be paid. Now, I would say one more thing about your great county, and I guess I'm going to have to go because it looks like Dr. Payne's running me out of here. <laughs> I know but, better than that, but, I, but, but, but I've got some let marching me, orders. Let me, let me say one but last thing. We have thing also about, lost people because of that, because they have not gotten paid, and so their businesses have gone defunct. And they are those small business people that have not been able to survive because of that. Now they've had to leave as well. So we're leave, losing good people because people's taxes are not getting paid. Well, let me, let me just say one last thing. What would you say, and I hope that this will be explained real soon. What would you just say if, if I said to you, you know, I got a tax obligation of $7 million and, and 18 months ago, the money was put in escrow away from me. And through our tax department and different little disputes here and there, it just sat out there. And for all, all that time, I've taken all the beating and beating and beating, and the money's been there for 18 months. 18 months. And you know what I could do? Just nothing. I could do nothing about it. 
Nothing. That's what you'll see. You'll see the very person that's sitting here that never, ever will tell you anything but the truth is telling you the truth again right now. And I will tell you this about McDowell County. I'm there a pretty good little bit because when I go to find a place to escape or run away, whether it be on Sunday or Saturday or, in, or 8 o'clock at night, a lot of times I'll end up in McDowell County to see my son, just check on him, just to get away. And that county is a beautiful county. And really and truly, now just think with me one second, and then I'll be done. The amount of coal that has left that county is astounding. It's high-grade, steel-making, metallurgical coal. Why couldn't we, as a legislature and as a government, have long ago said, we're going to reward that county a little more because than what we have because where the extraction came from, those people should have benefited a little more. We should have done that. I would still be greatly in favor of that. You know, so the net of what I'm saying is if you happen to be producing all the corn that this state was ta collecting taxes on and you were producing it all in Wood County, then I think Wood County ought to probably get a little bit more of the, their fair share. If you drive through McDowell County today, it's better, but it's still a tough place. And we need to do more. Anyway, I thank you for listening to me. I thank you, Dr. Payne, for having me. I thank you for having a great stool for me. And I congratulate you on what you do. And I'll keep fighting the fight for you. God bless you. Please join with me in thanking Governor Justice for spending this afternoon with us. Thank you, Governor.